Welcome everyone to the fourth event in our summer Seleucate lecture series. Um, I uh, hope that the co-host uh, Rabbi, Rabbi Ben Skolnick will soon be joining us or rejoining us. Um, I am very pleased that today's speaker will be uh, Sylvan and Jera, but before I say a little bit more about her, I um, start this time with introducing our expert uh, commentator. Um, Dr. John Serrati, who uh, was uh, well, who stepped in very um, generously on short notice, and I'm very, very happy that he took over the task. I got to know John um, in the context of Seleucid Study Day four, uh, four at McGill University in 2013, and uh, well, I knew that he was an expert in all matters of imperial history and also um, monetary history, um, but browsing through his CV showed me how broad actually his interests are. Most, mo many of his interests going back to uh, a very in-depth study of um, the island of Sicily in um, the Punic and uh, Roman period. And uh, well, many books and articles have followed um, over the last 20 years. Um, so, some of his uh, research ex expertise has gone into imperial structures. Um, also, uh, well, one important ramification, which is money and economic sides. But he also has um, several publications on military matters and weaponry in particular. So, uh, I'm very grateful to have your expertise following Sylvan and Storm. Um, Sylvan and uh, Jera, or Dr. Sylvan and Jera, as we have just uh, understood, gained her PhD at Manchester University, I think it was last year, um, with um, a thesis on uh, several matters or, or say special forces um, in the Greek army, I think in the classical and Hellenistic periods, especially mounted forces, including such exotic forces as elephants, um, and, and chariots. Ben is trying to come in all the time. I will give it another chance. Uh, and uh, so, uh, of course, a very broad, um, uh, well, uh, component is that of cavalry fighters. And uh, today's chapter will be on a special topic on cavalry fighting, namely, um, Silvanen pursues the question. Um, whether the importance of cavalry uh, was reduced in the Hellenistic period as compared to um, the classical, or rather the Alexander uh, period. Um, one uh, point that I would like to mention is that Silvanen is very active in uh, the editorial team of the Ancient World magazine. Um, and uh, so um, this is really a very useful, um, neat uh, website that I got to know only very recently now is uh, an honorary research fellow um, studying the mounted forces in the Hellenistic army um, as a follow up on her PhD studies and her present paper will focus on numeric aspects of the mounted forces in Hellenistic royal armies. You could hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. <laughs> right. Good. So, so you, the floor is yours. Okay, I will share my slides. Hopefully, everyone can see them. Can everyone see the slides? Yes. Yes. Right. Good. Okay. So, it is a great pleasure to be able to speak here today as part of this lecture series and. Thank you to everyone for attending. So today I'm going to talk to you about the Seleucids infantry cavalry ratios and how an appreciation of <clears throat> this numerical evidence can shed light on our understanding of ancient warfare. Now, this is still a work in progress, so, and it is connected to a larger article that I'm currently working on, on the development and fluctuation of infantry cavalry ratios throughout the classical Greek and Hellenistic periods as a whole. So I would welcome any suggestions or comments on these ideas. Despite the recent rehabilitation of the Hellenistic period in modern scholarship, 
as one of continuing development and sophistication, there remains a persistent idea in the study of Hellenistic military history that although this period was one of great technical innovation and experimentation, militarily it suffered from tactical stagnation and qualitative decline. This is particularly prevalent in assessments of Hellenistic cavalry. In light of the dominant role that cavalry played in Alexander the Great's army, modern scholars have often judged the Hellenistic world by the same standards. Disappointed by a perceived lack of decisive mounted warfare in comparison, military scholarship has commonly dismissed Hellenistic cavalry as having gradually lost its importance as a tactical arm. In particular, a fascinating yet understudied aspect of these claims is the argument of several scholars that, as well as experiencing a drop in quality and battlefield efficacy, Hellenistic cavalry also underwent a decline in numerical importance, regarding its proportion to the infantry contingents of the army. Rather than an average infantry cavalry ratio of around 7 to 1, which we see for Alexander the Great's army, scholars argue that the normal ratio of Hellenistic armies was around 10 to 1, in line with what they often identify as typical of earlier classical Greek proportions. Despite this, it is notable that none of the scholars who make these generalizations actually consider this evidence in any real detail. Indeed, this issue as a whole is broadly understudied in current scholarship. There is admittedly some brief work on this topic by Neil Trek, Hatsopoulos, Spence, and Tuplin, but this remains rather limited. Mieltrek and Hatsopoulos, for example, make only brief references to this issue. Mieltrek devotes four sentences to Seleucid ratios, whilst Hatsopoulos has two paragraphs concerning the development of Macedonian cavalry and its proportions under Alexander and Hellenistic rulers. In contrast, Spence's two-page table of cavalry proportions deals only with the data for classical Athens. Additionally, although Tuplin spends some time considering the infantry cavalry ratios of Achaemenid Persia, Persian armies, he simply claims that we are accustomed to regard the classical Greek norm as a ratio of roughly 10 to 1, without comparing this assumption to the evidence itself. There is consequently a significant gap in our understanding. I should at this juncture point out the existence of Catherine Rubencombe's incredible database, the Rubencombe Numbers in Greek Historiography Project a project which has set out to compile statistical data on all of the numbers present in Greek historiography from 500 BC to 300 AD, and currently has data available on Herodotus, Thucydides, Xenophon, Polybius, and Diodorus. Of course, as is usually the way with these things, although I was aware of the existence of this database and this project, it was only after I'd spent hours compiling all of my own tables by hand that I realized that part of this database was actually available online, although I do believe it is a relatively recent online edition. So to save you all that time and effort, I've included the web address here on the PowerPoint in case anyone else is interested. That said, it is worth noting that Rubencombe's database and my own are slightly different. Rubencombe is, as I noted, interested in all of the numbers in Greek historiography whereas I am interested only in the infantry and cavalry figures and their corresponding ratios. I am also interested not only in Greek historiography, but also Roman authors, and indeed other genres beyond historical narratives. It is therefore my hope that in the future, our databases will be able to complement each other, providing a valuable resource for those interested in quantitative research of the ancient world. Analyzing an army's infantry cavalry ratios across their various military engagements is an important aspect of understanding how much emphasis commanders placed on each arm and a useful way of tracing military developments and troop diversity over time. Moreover, it is an indirect marker of social and cultural attitudes towards different forms of military service. The attitudes of a particular city or kingdom towards each specific campaign and the amount of their population that were available or that they were willing to risk for battle at any given moment. So this numerical evidence can tell us a lot of useful information that can aid not just our understandings of the minutiae of ancient warfare, but it can also, under, it, it can also inform us about socio-political attitudes and how different cultures and kingdoms react to that warfare at any particular time. Now, 
Of course, I don't think it will be of any surprise to state that the use of numbers in ancient sources and the issues surrounding their interpretation are incredibly complex. In battle narratives especially, reported figures are conventionally rounded estimates, and there was a tendency of both eyewitnesses and writers with a particular political or religious agenda to underestimate the number of their own forces, whilst exaggerating the size of their opponents. It is important to remember that ancient histories were deliberate literary creations in which style was paramount, and we must remain aware of the rhetorical conventions that governed historical narratives when analysing them. We therefore need to use ancient figures with caution and compare them to those reported by other historians wherever possible. Where only one account of a particular military event has survived, it is necessary to establish the historical context, ensuring that the numbers provided in the source are congruent with the political and military realities of the time. A further issue is the fact that there are many battles for which the sources provide no details at all. This is particularly problematic with regards to cavalry. Whilst it is not uncommon for infantry contingents to be numbered and specified in full, quite frequently mounted forces are simply identified as a collective. And I've used Polybius's account of the Seleucid army at Raphia to illustrate this. Although it is worth noting that Polybius does at least give us numbers for the cavalry here, even if he simply labels them as tone hippeo. Therefore, even within the partial coverage of our evidence, our picture is not a full one. Nevertheless, despite these complications, I shall show that it is possible to observe a general numerical framework that can shed interesting light on the use of cavalry, specifically Seleucid cavalry in this period. So let's turn to the Seleucid evidence. As we can see here, there are 12 instances where the Seleucid's infantry and cavalry numbers are recorded. It is important to note that these instances only cover set-piece battles or notable military forces down to the Battle of Alassa in 160 BC. The Daphne Parade of circa 165 BC is notably absent from this list due to the propagandistic nature of this event, which complicates assessments of the contingents present and the extent to which this parade accurately reflects the military realities of the Seleucid Empire. I've also drawn a line under Alassa as the sources become incredibly sparse and fragmentary after this date. However, if there are any major instances that you think that I've missed, either within this time period or especially after 160 BC, I would be very grateful to hear about them so that I can add them to the database I'm working on. As a consequence of the inclusion of both set piece battles and notable military forces, I should note that the numbers that I consider in this paper consists of a mix of both those which are reported as being specifically present on the battlefield for a particular engagement, as well as those which are sometimes given for the total mobilization or recruitment of Seleucid troops prior to a specific battle or campaign. The reason for this is simply that given the sparsity of our sources, we are often provided with only one set of figures for each instance, and our sources are not consistent in whether they record either battlefield figures or overall mobilization figures. Therefore, we rarely have the privilege of choosing between these different totals for our analysis. Of the 12 instances listed here on the PowerPoint, only nine are actually relevant for our assessments of the Army's typical infantry cavalry proportions. In particular, we should discount the 12 to 1 ratio provided in Polybius's account of Achaeus's march against Selge in 218 BC, since Achaeus, who had revolted against Antiochus III, only had access to the troops in Asia Minor. Given that it is likely that the majority of the Seleucid cavalry came from eastern satrapies such as Media, this possibly disproportionately affected the infantry cavalry ratios of individual regions of the empire. Moreover, Selge's location in the Pisidian Mountains and the fact that the city was already under siege by one of Achaeus' generals means that this campaign did not favor a large cavalry presence anyway. Therefore, although this ratio is not far from the 10 to 1 which previous scholars have claimed characterized Hellenistic battlefield proportions, it is not comparable to the Seleucid's typical set piece battles where the full army was present. The applicability of the numbers recorded for Antiochus's defense of Thermopylae in 191 BC is similarly questionable. 
Although both Libby and Appian state that 10,000 infantry and 500 cavalry were present, a ratio of 20 to 1, we should note the special circumstances surrounding Antiochus's Greek expedition. Not only was Antiochus in a hurry to cross over into Greece, and so could not wait to mobilize the whole Seleucid army, but it is worth noting that if all the troops had been transported to Greece, any kind of defeat there would have been tantamount to suicide. Antiochus had also been hoping to join forces with Philip V and other Greek cities, and so had assumed and hoped that his allies would have been able to muster more men. Furthermore, when we deal with the 10,000 infantry and 500 cavalry reported for Antiochus's army, it is notable that both Livy and Appian frequently repeat these figures. According to Livy, Antiochus's landing force at Telium allegedly consisted of 10,000 infantry and 500 cavalry. Similarly, despite losses over the winter, both Livy and Appian note that the Seleucid kings deployed 10,500 troops at Thermopylae. Finally, in the aftermath of the battle, both of our sources tell us that the Romans captured 10,000 Seleucid prisoners, whilst Antiochus escaped with only 500 horsemen. This repetition is highly suspect, although the figures may not necessarily be wrong in every instance. Given that Antiochus's army was not at full or even desirable strength, we cannot securely compare the numerical data provided here to other Seleucid engagements. Similar concerns over the validity of the reported Seleucid numbers are also evident for the Battle of Beth Sur in 164 BC, which I shall explain later in this paper. Of the nine remaining engagements, it's fair to say that Raphia and Magnesia are the clearest examples of a typical Seleucid set piece battle, and I do say typical in air quotes. Here. One could therefore argue that theoretically, the infantry cavalry ratios of these two engagements should illustrate the Seleucid's ideal battlefield proportions. However, it is notable that these two occasions provide very different results. On the one hand, Polybius records that 62,000 Seleucid infantry and 6,000 cavalry, producing an infantry cavalry ratio of around 10 to 1, fought at Raphia in 217 BC against 70,000 infantry and 5,000 cavalry under Ptolemy IV, which gives us a Ptolemaic ratio of 14 to 1. There is some suggestion in modern scholarship that Polybius drew his information for Raphia from a pro-Ptolemaic source, implying that the Seleucid's numerical disadvantage seems more reliable, but this issue remains uncertain, and Wallbank has alternatively proposed that the Seleucid total given here may be larger than Antiochus's actual army for this battle though he does not dismiss Polybius's figures outright. <clears throat> On the other hand, an extensive Seleucid army confronted the Romans at Magnesia. Just prior to this battle, Livy tells us that a small Seleucid force of 4,000 infantry and 600 cavalry attacked Pergamon, giving us a ratio of 6.6 .6 to 1. This stronger emphasis on the cavalry in comparison to the 10 to 1 scene at Raphia is interesting, and cautions us from assuming that all Hellenistic ratios simplistically declined from what we see under Alexander the Great. Moreover, although we might object that the force at Pergamon was only small, and is therefore not necessarily indicative of the Seleucid army as a whole, if we look at the evidence for the subsequent battle at Magnesia, we see a similar occurrence. <clears throat> Appian claims that Antiochus's force at Magnesia totals 70,000, whilst Livy initially notes 60,000 infantry and over 12,000 cavalry, producing a ratio of around 5 to 1. This is significantly different to the 10 to 1 scene at Raphia, although Griffith has claimed that Livy's cavalry figures are greatly exaggerated. Whilst Livy initially states that there were around 12,000 Seleucid horsemen, his description of the individual contingents themselves adds up only to 11,700, plus an unspecified number of Terentines. Typically, modern scholars following Cromer in his 1907 work Antike Schlachtfelder have suggested that the Terentines present in this battle were around 500 strong, which would bring the overall cavalry figure to 12,200, which would fit with Livy's claim that there were more than 12,000 Seleucid horsemen, plus the Odecum Milia Equitum, present in this battle. Since recorded Seleucid cavalry figures rarely exceed 10,000, 
Griffith's objection that Livy's numbers are exaggerated is not unreasonable. Nevertheless, Magnesia was a particularly important battle for Antiochus. It is therefore not inconceivable that he could have mobilized this many cavalry troops, intending to overawe the Romans with the impressive extent and variety of his army. Other complications potentially arise, however, with Livy's infantry figures. In contrast to his stated 60,000 prior to the battle, his list of individual contingents adds up only to 55,200, and this is assuming that the Argoraspides were 10,000 strong. Despite this, Livy's description of the Seleucid army makes no mention of the light infantry elephant guards, usually around 50 men per elephant, giving a total of 2,700 to protect the 54 Seleucid elephants that were present. Additionally, Livy does not mention those troops who were presumably left to guard the Seleucid camp, and it has been suggested by modern scholars that these were possibly around 3,000 men. When these contingents are included, the Seleucid infantry comes to around 60,900, again, just slightly higher than Livy's initial round of 60,000. It is possible that the number of camp guards was not quite 3,000, which is only an estimated figure, bringing the overall total closer to Livy's initial claim. Alternative infantry figures have, however, been proposed by Sherwin White and Kurtz in their seminal work From Samarkand to Sardis, where they suggest a total of 59,200, and also by Apergis, who suggests a total of 60,200. These alternative figures, however, rely on miscalculations of the number of elephants or elephant guards. Sherwin White and Kurt suggest only 1,000 elephant guards, which works out to around 18 or 19 men per elephant, which is arguably too low. Whilst the Pergus acknowledges only 50 Seleucid elephants for this battle, rather than 54. We should therefore treat these alternatives with caution. In light of this, we can see that whilst the Seleucid army at Raphia appears to support the claim that Hellenistic infantry cavalry ratios were typically 10 to 1, its formation at Magnesia stands in strong contrast, placing even more emphasis on the cavalry than Alexander himself typically did. Furthermore, it's particularly interesting that both of these battles occurred under Antiochus III's reign within 27 years of each other. Given this disparity, it is clear that despite representing ideal Seleucid battles, these two engagements alone cannot eliminate the Seleucid's typical infantry cavalry proportions. It is thus necessary to assess the other instances where Seleucid battlefield figures are recorded in order to set the ratios of Raphia and Magnesia in context and determine whether either are anomalies or alternatively part of a bigger Seleucid pattern. The first military engagement of our period for which we have evidence is Ipsus in 301 BC. Despite this battle's importance for the wars of the Diadochi, the only full surviving account is from Plutarch's life of Demetrius, who was not interested in writing a purely historical or military narrative. We must therefore analyze the details of Plutarch's account carefully, especially given his tendency simply to leave things out of battle descriptions. In particular, Plutarch records that the allies, so Seleucus and Lysimachus, had 64,000 infantry and 500 more horse than Antigonus, so a total of 10,500 cavalry, giving an infantry cavalry ratio of around 6 to 1. However, there are complications with this cavalry figure. Just before the battle, Theodorus notes that whilst wintering in Cappadocia, Seleucus had almost 12,000 cavalry. It is possible that Seleucus did not bring his full complement with him to Ipsus. Indeed, he may have left some cavalry behind to guard his supply line back to Babylonia. Nevertheless, we should not dismiss the critical importance of this battle for the Allies, nor the size of Antigonus's opposing force, which was over 70,000 infantry and 10,000 cavalry, hence a ratio of around 7 to 1. Furthermore, it is reasonable to assume that Lysimachus also had some cavalry of his own. One solution to this has been proposed by Bar Kochba, who suggests that the Allied cavalry figure at Ipsus was actually closer to 15,000. He suggests that rather than Pentecosius, 500, Plutarch's Greek should read Pentecosius, 5,000. 
pointing to another occasion where Plutarch's Life of Demetrius and Diodorus disagree between the figures 500 and 5,000. If Bar Kochba's emendation is accepted, the Allied infantry cavalry ratio would be around 4.3 to 1. However, whilst there is a slight issue concerning Plutarch's Pentecost use in the manuscripts, this concerns only Linscog's emendation of the dative Pentecosiois to the accusative Pentecosius. I therefore tentatively suggest that we adopt a middle ground between Plutarch and Barkochva, yielding a ratio of around five to one. Nevertheless, even if we were to stick with Plutarch's suggested 6.1 to one, it is immediately clear that the Allies' infantry cavalry ratio at Ipsus parallels that recorded for Magnesia in contrast both to Raffia and the claims of the modern scholarship regarding typical Hellenistic ratios. The battlefield proportions of both armies in this engagement are also similar to those of Alexander the Great, although this is perhaps unsurprising given that the Diadochi themselves served under Alexander and adopted his tactics. Although one could object that the Allied force at Ipsus was not composed solely of Seleucid troops, meaning that it is debatable how far we can accurately compare these figures to other Seleucid battles, its status as the first battle of our period nevertheless allows it to act as a starting point against which we can track the development of Seleucid practice. Almost a century later, Antiochus III embarked on his momentous Eastern expedition, for which he attained the title Megas or the Great. Unfortunately, Polybius's rather fragmentary account does not explicitly state the size of Antiochus's army, merely describing it as particularly large, duname telecaute. Despite this, in a passing comment, Justin notes that when Antiochus marched against Arsaces of Parthia, he ha had 100,000 foot and 20,000 horse, a ratio of five to one. Naturally, the these figures along with Justin's questionable reliability has led to their general dismissal. However, given the scale and importance of recovering the empire's eastern territories, as well as the West's relative stability following the Fourth Syrian War, it is not impossible that the army exceeded its typical battlefield strength of 60 to 80,000 men, especially in light of Polybius's description of them as so large a force. Additionally, Polybius notes that the cavalry, light infantry, and 10,000 peltasts accompanied Antiochus on his forced night march to Deporia in around 208 BC. Although the overall figures for these troops are unknown, the fact that this was only a small force selected for its maneuverability and yet still comprised over 10,000 infantry supports the claim that the full army's total was significant. Furthermore, Apergus, in his 2004 work on the Seleucid royal economy, noted that the mint output at Seleucia on the Tigris at this time vastly exceeded its usual peacetime production, suggesting very high military expenditure. It is therefore reasonable to accept that Justin's figures are not completely outrageous, even if it is plausible that they were rounded up. Since this expedition came not long after Raffia, this five to one ratio challenges any impression of the cavalry's numerical decline following Ipsus, and combined with Antiochus's similar ratio at Magnesia, questions the typicality of his 10 to 1 in 270 BC. A ratio of around 5 to 1 is once again seen for the Battle of Amawis in 165 BC. However, here the validity of the numbers becomes much more problematic, and it is well documented that the authors, such as the Maccabees, often heavily distorted their numerical data to emphasize the heroism of Judas Maccabeus and his followers. According to one Maccabees, Lysias initially set out with 40,000 infantry and 7,000 cavalry. Additionally, the night before the battle, Gorgias, one of Lysias's commanders, took 5,000 infantry and 1,000 cavalry to make a surprise attack on the Jewish camp. Despite this, several scholars have dismissed these figures, especially since the same source states that at least half of the Seleucid army was currently campaigning east of the Euphrates under Antiochus IV. <clears throat> Although it is not impossible for a force of 47,000 to have comprised only half of the Seleucid army, we should remember that following the Treaty of Apamea in 188 BC, the Seleucids at least officially lost access to the manpower of Asia Minor. 
which would have affected the amount of troops they could call up. Indeed, the evident posturing and desire to emphasize the numerical might of the Seleucid Empire in this account introduces an element of doubt. Antiochus gathered all the forces of his empire, a very powerful army. Additionally, although the author of two Maccabees does not provide a total figure for the Seleucid's force at Emmaus, it is notable that he claims that it was not less than 20,000, suggesting that the author of one Maccabees exaggerated the Seleucid's numbers. Similar concerns appear, as I briefly noted earlier, for the Battle of Beth Sur in the following year in 164 BC, for which one Maccabee states that the Seleucid force, still no more than half of the army, consisted of 60,000 infantry and 5,000 cavalry, a ratio of 12 to 1, whereas two Maccabees claims that there were 80,000 infantry and thousands of cavalry. Naturally, we cannot accept these figures which fit better with a Seleucid army at full strength, although the falling infantry-cavalry ratio here is intriguing. Despite the frequency of a 5 to 1 infantry-cavalry ratio for the Seleucid army in the examples that I've discussed, the final two battles of our period re-establish a 10 to 1 ratio similar to Raphia, although even here ascertaining the accuracy of the evidence is complex. For Beth Zechariah in 162 BC, we have three different sets of numbers. First, Juan Maccabees and Josephus's Antiquitatis Judicae record 100,000 Seleucid infantry and 20,000 cavalry. Although these give a ratio of 5 to 1, these figures are vastly exaggerated, and other than potentially Antiochus III's eastern expedition, there is no other known instance of the Seleucids ever employing this many cavalrymen, or indeed this many men in general, in a single engagement. Alternatively, Two Maccabees claims that there were 110,000 infantry and 5,300 cavalry, a ratio of just over 20 to 1. Once again, the infantry figure is clearly implausible. However, the moderate 5,300 for the cavalry is worth considering. Unlike the 20,000 of one Maccabees, this lower figure is much more acceptable and accords with other Seleucid cavalry totals. Furthermore, it finds an interesting parallel with the cavalry number recorded in Josephus's Bellum Judicum, which provides our third set of figures, a much more plausible 50,000 infantry and 5,000 cavalry. Although Josephus closely followed one Maccabees in his Antiquitatis Judicae, his earlier version of the battle presented in the Bellum Judicum was clearly based on a different source, possibly Nicholas of Damascus. Nevertheless, the credibility of this final set of numbers which are much more comparable with those of other Hellenistic engagements, and the similarity of the cavalry total to the notably specific figure of two Maccabees suggests that they, and the 10 to 1 infantry cavalry ratio that they provide, are relatively correct. Similarly, a 10 to 1 ratio is also evident at Alassa, for which one Maccabees records 20,000 infantry and 2,000 cavalry under the command of Maccabees. Despite the unreliability of one Maccabees' figures elsewhere, which are often considerably inflated, these comparatively low numbers do not appear unreasonable. Barkochva suggests that the author did not exaggerate the number of the Seleucid army in this case, because he instead deliberately manipulated the Jewish figures, giving an extremely low figure of only 800 men for the rebels, allowing him to supply an excuse for the death of Judas Maccabeus and amplify Judas's bravery since he fought against the Seleucids until the very end, despite the odds against him. I admit that I find this explanation quite plausible. Moreover, considering the state of the Seleucid Empire at this time, the suggestion that there were only 20,000 Seleucid infantry and 2,000 Seleucid cavalry at Atalassa gains further credibility. After a period of enforced exile in Rome following the terms of the Treaty of Apamea, Demetrius I landed at Tripolis in Syria in 162 BC, where he swiftly had his nephew, who was the current king Antiochus V, and the regent Lysias, killed. Despite the general acceptance of Demetrius, Timarchus, the satrap of Media, refused to acknowledge him as king and seized the satrapy as well as Babylonia, declaring himself king with the eventual support of the Roman Senate. This assumption of royal power, along with its Roman support, constituted an important threat to Demetrius, not only to the possible stability of his kingdom, 
but also the recruitment potential of his army, since Media was home to some of the best horse racing grounds of the ancient world, as well as some of the royal horses, but also his reputation as a legitimate and successful Seleucid king. Consequently, despite his desire to end the Hasmonean problem, it is unlikely that Demetrius could have given Maccabees many more than the 22,000 troops that one Maccabees records, as it would have been unwise, given the threat, to risk a large amount of his army on the Judean campaign. Thus, as with Beth Zechariah, I would argue that we should accept this 10 to 1 ratio for the Seleucid army, which differs from the frequent 5 to 1 ratio of many of the engagements analysed above, but accords with the proportionate raffia. Whether this indicates an increasing emphasis on infantry in the later Seleucid period, however, remains uncertain and would require further analysis into the later military engagements beyond 160 BC. Although, as I mentioned at the start of this paper, our sources are not great for this later period. So, to conclude then, we can see that despite the pervasive uncertainties of the sources, neither the 10 to 1 infantry cavalry ratio of Raffia nor the 5 to 1 of Magnesia are uncharacteristic of Seleucid factions. Rather, it seems that fluctuation between these two points was common for the Seleucid army. It is therefore clear that their relative proportions of infantry and cavalry were far from static. And when we look elsewhere in the Hellenistic period, and also even the classical period as well, we see similar fluctuations in infantry cavalry ratios. Unfortunately, due to time constraints, I've not been able to cover this other evidence today, but the graph here on the PowerPoint illustrates the overall fluctuations of these periods. Although it may be true that the Hellenistic period does not necessarily see the same level of consistency in its numerical emphasis on the cavalry as we see under Alexander the Great, it is clear that the claims of a standard infantry cavalry ratio for the Hellenistic period are simplistic and misleading, and there is no evidence for an overall decline in the cavalry's numerical importance. It is crucial to note that the continual variation of infantry and cavalry is not an indication of a lack of understanding on the part of commanders of the necessary or desirable proportion of these forces, nor is it evidence of a decline in one element's tactical significance in favour of another. Rather, as I hope to have shown with the Seleucid examples that I've discussed, I would argue that the relative sizes of infantry and cavalry contingents are specifically tailored in each instance to the individual contingent in individual conditions of the particular battle or campaign, such as the battlefield's topography or the nature of their allies and enemies and the socio-political circumstances of the time. And it is important that we remain aware of these nuances. Moreover, these variations highlight the continued sophistication and adaptability of Seleucid military thinking and Hellenistic military attitudes more broadly, refuting previous scholarship's general dismissal of this period as one of stagnation and deterioration. Therefore, despite the complications of dealing with numbers in ancient sources and the care that is needed to use them, I hope today to have illustrated their importance for our understanding and the need to consider this evidence in greater detail. Thank you. Thank you very much, Silvanen. Um, and while I withhold comments, comments on the content and quality of your um, argument, I do already want to um, commend you very much for the clarity of your slides, uh, which were a very great help to, to help us over the couple of glitches that probably most of us have experienced. Um, so the internet connections are not in our hand, but the combined uh, presentation that you have given um, by drawing on these excellent slides has helped us um, very clearly understand your argument with all its details. So I pass on um, the floor to John Serati. All right, okay. Um, uh, Sylvan, and thank you for that. Thank you so much for that uh, excellent and enlightening paper um which of course i uh, uh um you know full disclosure as as the respondent i was able to to read beforehand and and really get in depth with um so i i overall i i really liked how uh the paper did did well to illustrate the the bias against cavalry uh not just in our primary sources but in the secondary literature as well and i think 
probably my biggest takeaway from the paper is uh, how the former bias probably influenced the latter one, right? That, that because there's a bias in the primary sources, that gave rise to a bias in the secondary sources. Um, clearly, ancient sources were not used to cavalry being an important or even the main strike force of an army. And um, I, I'm, I'm wondering openly, uh, as, a, as a means perhaps later of, of starting a conversation, um, if this might be a, a, a holdover from, uh, you know, particularly, I, I know because you said you, you, you have other parts of this, uh, uh, this paper, this chapter that focus on the classical world, if this might be a holdover from a focus on hoplite warfare uh, in the classical period, uh, uh, imbued as it was with notions of arite, notions of masculinity. Um, and then later on, uh, once we get to the late Hellenistic period, if this might be a kind of looking forward by authors who are writing later, kind of, if you see what I mean, they're, they're looking far back, but then looking towards their, I guess, their own time as well, a focus on the Roman legions where, where, where uh, uh, infantry cre clearly rules the day on the, on, on the battlefield, right? Um, and I think th th this really speaks to the idea of uh, the, the way uh, um, I've always looked at Philip and Alexander as being anomalies in the history of ancient warfare, representative of the only period when cavalry were truly dominant on the battlefield, right? So now I'd like to raise a few points as a means of initiating uh, uh, discussions. And then uh, I have some thoughts on uh, um, research that you maybe all be already be doing or, or future research. Um, and uh, uh, Altai gave me the option of going through these and having you respond, but I think I'll, I'll just go through all of them at once. Um, and, and I'm perfectly willing to uh, share these notes with you if you, if you like, right? Um, I, I'd like to know how you see uh, my argument, the argument that I made in the uh, Oxford Handbook of Warfare in the Classical World about uh, um, how the, the increased numbers in the Hellenistic world represent an attempt to replace um, quality cavalry with quantity, right? And I think your numbers bear this out. So we see 10 to 1 at Raphia, uh, but then we see 5 to 1 at Magnesia, right? And so uh, this could support a thesis that the Seleucids are trying to make up for a lack of quality cavalry by simply employing more horsemen, right? And then there's also the possibility that we see, as, as you explained, that there's, there's at least a possibility that we see five to one at Beth Zachariah as well, right? Um, you, you, I, I, this is a, a separate point now. You, um, you finished off by, by saying that um, th this could represent um, uh, th this this fluctuation in cavalry numbers responding to different circumstances could represent um, a sophistication on the part of Seleucid commanders. It struck me that uh, the opposite could equally be true, that, um, th that this lack of consistency could, could also be a sign of military inept ineptitude, that these guys actually just don't know what they're doing. And they're like, well, we'll throw this many cavalry in and we'll throw this many cavalry. So it, I think for me, that's something I, I questioned uh, um, uh, uh, constructively that it, it, is the, it, does this really show sophistication or, or, or does, this, does this show that there really is no long-term planning. There really is no, uh, uh, that, they, that, that many of them, uh, in fact, most of them, I, I, I would argue even Antiochus III don't, aren't really that sophisticated. Um, within your paper, uh, I, I think my, the biggest uh, uh, um, constructive point I would, I would make is, uh, and perhaps this is in other parts of your research, but you claim, that um, studying Seleucid cavalry ratios can inform us about socio-political attitudes and how different cultures and kingdoms reacted to warfare at any particular time. So my main question is, what do all these figures prove? What do they say about the ability of the Seleucids to wage war? 
Do they say anything about attitudes towards cavalry, either in our ancient sources or amongst Hellenistic generals themselves? Um, I think, I, again, I return to the point that the paper does really well to, to, to challenge standard narratives. And I, I really love that about the paper. That was excellent. But it, how do these con the conclusions, the excellent conclusions you've reached, and in my opinion, proven, how do they nuance our views about the Seleucids and their empire? You know, uh, um, and, and, and you address some of this in your conclusion. But, uh, um, you know, I'm wondering about um, the role of logistics. You know, I realize you probably didn't have time to go into this, but the role of logistics. Um, I, you know, a little personal piece here, and I realize this is <laughs> recorded, but anyway, that, that uh, my daughter worked on a farm or has been working on a farm this summer with horses. I'm like, oh, wow. Horses eat so much. Like I was in the race in the middle of a city. So like, I'm like, you know, I always knew horses ate a lot, but then I actually saw it with my own two eyes. I'm like, wow, these beings consume a lot of food, right? So there has to be a, a, a tremendous amount of preparation involved. You, you, you said in your conclusion, there's uh, um, certainly there, there has to be a role of, uh, uh, of the terrain, right? And how much fodder is available because I know ancient armies are really up until World War One that that it, it was a consideration of, of armies, and that's mainly why they didn't campaign in the winters because they want horses to 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 live off the land as much as possible, right? Um, not just uh, and and then you know I know the Seleucids at certain times, could, especially Antiochus the Third, could um, place supplies in cities, so. Is there kind of cities to act as supply depots on a line of march, right? Clearly, if you're invading territory, there's not going to be, right? Um, and then I come back to the economic thing. Um, skilled riders are paid more. Um, and and were the still, you could simply unwilling to make the investment in quality cavalry. And so I returned to that point, my original point, and did they try and make up for this with quantity, right? I think considering how little we have on Seleucid logistics, uh, um, I, I think this could be a tremendous uh, uh, contribution to scholarship on top of what you've already done, which I think has uh, done really, really well to, uh, um, to challenge standard narratives and, and, to, and, and, and illustrates how we get these standard narratives in, in modern scholarship. There's a bias in, in ancient scholarship against cavalry, and that carries over into modern scholarship. So anyway, I, I'm sorry, I, 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 un, I, 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 I unpacked a lot of stuff there. And um, yeah, that's my response. So. Yeah, so thank you for all of that. Yeah, the thing that you mentioned about the bias of the sources is definitely um, something we have to deal with. But our sources like to talk about infantry and especially they like to talk about heavy infantry. And I definitely think that that's kind of a hangover from the classical period where the hoplite is the force that they want to talk about the most. Even if the cavalry are still important in the classical period, it's the hoplite that dominates what we know about it. That's also partly because we know mainly about Athens and Sparta and they like the hoplites. So that I think has definitely, as you say, um, forced our own conceptions sort of to follow along from that because, well, our sources don't care. They just say, oh, the cavalry were there and they were, there were 6,000 of them. They don't tell us like how many, like who was there. And that's incredibly frustrating when you want to know. So I think that has definitely affected how we deal with that. And that Philip and Alexander are sort of the anomalies to that because they, particularly Alexander, he, he's a cavalry commander. So you talk about the cavalry a lot more because that's what he's doing. And that's where a lot of like the major charges and the battles and the decisive action is coming from. It's the fact that he's commanding the cavalry and he's charging off. So I think that has potentially skewed our interpretations a bit. And I, I like the idea of our later sources looking forward to Rome and the rise of the legions and particularly when you've got like Polybius who's like very adamant you know the legion is much better and it and like here are all the reasons why you know it's better than 
the Hellenistic phalanx. I think that's already starting to change our opinion that, oh, this is a very much an infantry thing, not a cavalry thing. So yeah, I definitely think that that is part of the reason why modern scholarship has traditionally taken that narrative, because it's what we see in the sources until you start to really drill down into, well, well the numbers don't say that, so. Yeah. As for your argument in your earlier paper, um, particularly regarding um, the quality of the cavalry, here I would probably disagree that I actually think the Seleucids have a pretty good high quality cavalry, at least in terms of the horses, because they have access to some of the best horses in the ancient world. So particularly the horses from the Nisaean Plains in Media, these are really, really good heavy cavalry horses. We know that later they become the cataphract horses because they're suitable for carrying all that armor. And the Seleucids also have access to lighter horses as well and possibly some step horses. So I would say horse-wise, there's definitely no decline in the quality of the horses. As for the riders, that becomes a little more murky because we don't know how well they were trained and things. I would point to when we see the cavalry in action, we can see them doing pretty sophisticated things when Antiochus is going off charging and ignoring the battle. So at Panion, I'm aware that the Battle of Panion is a mess and trying to understand Panion is confusing, but at Panion, there's the suggestion that the Seleucid cataphracts charge the opposing Ptolemaic cavalry and then turn into the exposed flank of the Ptolemaic infantry. And if that is correct, then that implies a lot of practice to be able to get that maneuver to happen and to happen so decisively. And there are other instances where the Seleucid cavalry is very decisive on the battlefield, like Ipsus, like Alassa. Even, I would say, the charge of Antiochus's charge at Magnesia, he does break through part of the Roman line. I would say his cavalry are still pretty good. Now, he does go off and chase the troops right the way to the camp and the whole thing falls apart. But I would say that I would say there is still a reasonable quality to the cavalry there. The numbers issue is an important one, though. That is something we do see in the Hellenistic period of more and more numbers, armies getting cute, bigger and bigger and bigger. And I think that's partly as well an attempt to get an edge over your opponents. That when you're fighting someone who has exactly the same arms as you, yeah. I think you're trying to gain whatever advantage you can get. And the Seleucids have access to like the most horses in the ancient world, so naturally they're going to say, well, we'll bring all the cavalry then. Um, as for the sophistication, again, I think this ties into whether you see the Seleucid cover cavalry as being sophisticated or whether you see it having this decline. So I see that I would argue that the Seleucids are still trying to do, you know, tactical things with their cavalry. They're still experimenting, like, where do they put them on the battlefield? They're not always on the flank. Sometimes they're in the center. Sometimes they're held in reserve. So I would say that that implies some level of military thinking, that you are trying to do things. It doesn't always work. Um, and I think that just ties into my idea, that, my argument that I wouldn't argue for a decline in the Hellenistic period. But I do appreciate that a lot of that is interpretation and that you could possibly argue that the other way. As for the fluctuation, uh, is it a case of, well, we don't know what we're doing, we're just throwing cavalry. It's like, well, that didn't work the last time, so we need more cavalry this time. It is possible, because we're never going to know what commanders thought, and you might say, well, what was Antiochus thinking at Magnesia bringing the chariots? Because they just didn't help. But at the same time, I would point to the fluctuation that is prevalent across the classical period and the Hellenistic period. But this fluctuation isn't something just the Seleucids were doing. It's true of every single army. Even Alexander's fluctuates. Um, his fluctuates less, but then he's the only one in charge of his army, so you'd expect it to fluctuate less. Um, so we see this fluctuation all over the place. So I don't necessarily think it's the fact that they don't know what they're doing. I think 
it very much depends on what the circumstances are at the time. As for what the figures prove, I think the figures, they can tell us a lot of different things. I mean, they don't just tell us who's at that battle. They tell us, did the Seleucids think that this was a very important battle? Did they send a full complement there or were they not bothered? Um, did they only send a few? And it, it can also, so that can tell us like, how many troops do the Seleucids have at this time? Are they interested in this battle? Are they over committing to this battle, sending far too many people? They don't really need to send that many. Um, and I think, again, that can be compared nicely to other periods. So I've been looking at the classical period, for example, the Sicilian expedition, when the Athenians send men to Sicily, they send loads of hoplites, and then they only send 30 cavalry. And that can tell us, you know, that, well, they clearly misjudged the situation there, and very quickly they send more cavalry afterwards to make up for the cavalry numbers. So I think they can tell us quite a lot, it, but it does depend on the questions you want to answer. As for logistics, I'd need to look into a lot more about logistics, as you mentioned. So lucid logistics are complicated. I did have a look at a little bit like where would you keep horses in the Seleucid Empire? What would you like? Where were like you know food resources kept? But to be honest, we really don't have any Seleucid evidence for that. We have to draw on accumulated sources. But yeah, horses definitely eat a lot. Elephants eat even more. <laughs> um, but I'd need to consider that more. I think. Okay. Yeah, that's. Uh, I I I I completely agree on uh, on many counts. I I often think the the chariots are, you know, they're they're just there exactly like you said because you know the the the, the Hellenistic armies look exactly the same. They're mirror images of one another. So one general is saying, well, what can I do to one up this other side? So that you know, and and you're right. The the so you could have more access to things like cataphracts, like chariots, like uh, camel archers and things like that. So, yeah, um, uh, and and uh, uh, so overall, yeah, uh, a, a lot to uh, uh, agree on, a lot to go on there. Um, I'll tie you. Well, thank you very much, both of you so far. Um, and uh, I, uh, I'm quite sure that all of us will agree that um, we will have to look at a much more differentiated use of uh, cavalry forces as much as every other means that, that were in place. Um, though I'm sure there will be many, many more detailed questions or um, other thoughts uh, Thoughts if I, um, before I throw in my own. I would rather want to open the floor to discussions. And if you can raise your hand, ideally digitally, because um, I see Ben, you can uh, you can uh, go ahead right now and all the others I encourage to use the raise hand function, which they find uh, or have access to in the participants bar. If you go to the uh, participant field, click it, you will see a list of participants. If you hover with the mouse over your own name, you will see a raise hand function. If you click that, I see that you want to speak up and I can call uh, on your name. Okay, and thank you, Altai. And I didn't, uh, I was sort of knocked off at the beginning. So I appreciate everybody being on here and thank you to the speaker and the respondent. Um, a couple of questions or, or sets of questions. One is, what do we know about recruitment? In other words, here I am and I'm Antiochus III. Am I sending out messages to all of my provinces or to all these kingdoms and saying, um, okay, we're, I'm going to be in a big war, everybody come. Um, and so, and then he gets what he gets. He gets this the number of infantry, he gets this number of cavalry, and then he goes to war with what comes in, right? As opposed to, okay, I'm looking for 30,000 uh, cavalry. Um, and, you know, can I get 10,000 Tarantines? Can I get, you know, so do we know anything about sort of recruitment and how all of that worked? And so if, if you know, what I, my suggestion is, if he, it's whatever came in, and and so we're talking about ratios and everything, but maybe those are the ratios that he went to war with because that's what he happened to have. So that's one question. The other question is, and you brought up Panion, which um, I've written about and I think about a lot. And there you have 
And, and I've written an article showing that it, the presence of Antiochus IV is probably bogus. But leaving that aside, he becomes the hero. This younger Antiochus becomes the hero as like a young Alexander. So we haven't left the model of the hero cavalry charge. Um, and um, and if, if you look at statistics, a lot in a lot of cases, a lot of the sources will tell us about the, the general and his personal cavalry. That's a phrase that comes up a lot, right? Which means that he was very tied in, in a kind of Alexander model to having a personal cavalry and to charging at the end and, and coming around the flank and being the hero. So that model, uh, I don't think, declines that much. So anyway, my two questions to you are, what do we know about recruitment? And is it possible that the ratios are just what they were? Because that's what came in. And the other one is, maybe that model of Alexander persisted through personal cavalry and this kind of heroic, and I think, as John said, sort of masculine thing. Yeah, so thank you. The question of recruitment. Now, this one's always going to be a complex question because of the nature of our sources. And I think it also depends on how you see the Seleucids military infrastructure as working. So when you suggest, is it, this is just what came in and Antiochus has to go to war with whatever he's got. Now, I certainly think there is some elements of that, particularly when, you know, you call up your allies or your and you're not entirely sure who will either turn up or what they'll bring. And I would argue that this is the reason we have the camel archers at Magnesia. I don't think Antiochus you know, thought, oh, I need some camel archers, we're gonna get some of those. I think he told the Arabians, we're going to war, turn up, and they turned up on camels. That said, I spent some time in my PhD thesis thinking about how is the Seleucid army actually structured? What is going on there? And I put forward a tripartite structure. So we have the Seleucid Royal Guard. So we've got 2,000 cavalry and possibly 10,000 infantry as the guard. Those are people who are always on duty. The, the king knows they're going to be there because they're his personal guard. I then would suggest that there is a military settlement system in the Seleucid Empire. Now, I'm aware that is highly disputed that some people say that this doesn't exist in the Seleucid Empire. I would argue that the evidence does suggest that it's there. Um, so that would mean that there are people scattered throughout the empire who have an obligation to serve. So that would give Antiochus or whoever the king is an idea of how many people at a minimum he can call up. Not that you're going to call every single one of them up, but it gives them, I think, a better idea of how many people you could call up for a major campaign. And then my final section of this infrastructure was the what I term the non-regulars, the people you only call up when you're going to major campaigns. So they don't have obligations to serve. They're, these are your allies, your mercenaries, your indigenous subjects to make up the numbers. Like you tell a particular satrap, we're going to war, bring some men and you expect him to turn up with them. So I think a bit of both to answer your question, which isn't really a major an answer, but is that he'd have some idea of some of the troops that he would be able to call up and that should turn up. Some of it is going to be a little more fluid. Like he might ask his allies to turn up. They might not turn up in the similar way that when we look at Thermopylae, and Antiochus is hoping that, you know, the Macedonians and the other Greeks will support him and then they don't and he's left with very few troops of his own. So I think it depends on circumstance and that's where you have to look at the individual um, instances. I'd love to be able to say more about recruitment, but the sources are what they are. We don't know very much more than that. As for Panion, as I said, this is a very complicated battle to actually understand and trying to work out what actually happened at this battle is not easy because Polybius just spends the entire time complaining that Zeno got it wrong. I definitely think there's something in that Alexander model, though, that the ghost of Alexander persists throughout the Hellenistic period, that 
And I think we even see that with Antiochus III when he's commanding the cavalry at Raphia and when he's commanding the cavalry at Magnesia, that he's got this idea of, you know, this heroic cavalry charge that he just gets wrong because he doesn't have Alexander's perfect timing for doing it. So I definitely think there is some kind of hangover of that in the Hellenistic period. I hope Thank that answers you. your questions. Thank you. Okay, I have uh, four more um, people who ha want to um, ask, uh, post their questions. I start with Riz, um, and just so you know that I took note of you um, to be followed by Brett, and then uh, in the, through the chat, bo chat box, Alice, and uh, finally, Niklas. So uh, Riz goes first. Hi, um, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh so I put my question in the Q&A, but it doesn't appear that was the right place to put it. So my apologies if you see it later. Um, I'm a statistician. And so I was wondering if you've done any systematic estimate of the errors, in particular involving the ratios, because ratios tend to be very problematic to estimate statistically. And I'm concerned about the validity of your data in that regard. Um, perhaps using Monte Carlo methods, for example? Yes, yeah, so I obviously am a Helena uh, historian by specialism and not a statistician. So I am not as well up on, say, some of the more numerical mathematical methods that you can apply to these numbers. So this is still, as I said, a work in progress and dealing with the raw data that our sources tell us. Um, I'm definitely open to suggestions for how to check my um, sources and check this data. So I'd be very grateful if you would suggest methods I could apply. Um, most of the time I'm left with trying to work out are the numbers that our sources tell us reliable and do they fit in the context that they're given? Because a lot of the numbers are problematic to start with anyway. Um, and as I said at the beginning, you know, they're usually just rounded estimates. So we do have to bear that in mind when we deal with them, but they're not going to be absolutely 100% precise. I'm just hoping to get a general idea of the sort of proportions that are at these particular engagements. But as I said, if you have any particular methods that you would suggest that could help, I would be very interested in hearing uh, so, them. so should I email you after the talk? Would that be helpful? That would be great if you don't mind. Thank you. Um, I just, I, I was, I feel that having reasonable error bars might in fact strengthen your analysis. And so I wanted, I was curious if you'd done anything of like that, because it does look offhand like you might be able to make an argument for a two bin method. So I was curious okay. if you'd done that. I thank haven't, you. but I'd be very interested to hear it and look more into it. So thank you. Thank you. So thank you for this intervention. And I suggest before we follow down um, the list that I've just uh, mentioned, if anyone has uh, a question or a comment specifically relating to statistical methods, um, uh, we might actually uh, hear that question or comment first. Um, my, con well, then, yeah, I call upon myself here. Um, I have one general concern um, relating to the treatment of the figures, um, and it has to do with, uh, well, with how to deal with errors, which we know are in the numbers. Um, but I somehow got the impression that where you find that the numbers are a bit too low for your application, apply all kinds of considerations what may have led to a lowering of the number, but you don't apply consistently these same concerns such as ideological um, uh, impact or um, uh, transmission errors where the numbers get closer to what you are expecting. So that is, well, this is potentially also a bias that may affect um, the individual uh, result of a number. And then of course, also the statistical average that you calculate. That is, it is very difficult um, 
with the few numbers we have and the wide range of pot, uh, possible uh, distortions we have, it, it's a very thorny field, but I do think it's worth mentioning that and thinking about this um, when, when you go through your numbers again, uh, then also play the, the devil's advocate um, and look at uh, the, um, the numbers from the other side. It, this is not as sophisticated as RIS's common. It's not methodologically sound from a statistical point, but at least an attempt at balancing our corrective approach uh, by something that looks more like a consistent approach to all these numbers. Yeah, and this is one of the reasons I say you do have to look at each individual number before sure. you can do much with them because every number is complicated. We don't have an example where, oh yeah, we can accept that number and it's fine. Um, for, and this is something I will think more when I move into this, the bigger article I'm writing, which is interested in particularly the bigger pictures. So the general fluctuations, that sort of idea and there the statistical method would be very, very helpful to try to apply. But yeah, I definitely take that advice on board. So thank you. Okay, then uh, Brett is next in line. Thank you. Uh, this was a great paper. Can everyone hear me? Can yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, sorry. Um, this was a great paper. Um, thank you for offering it. I, I have I have two things that that I wanted to uh, note. I mean, first, when we're talking about fluctuations in in the numbers and sort of does this indicate a, a relative incapacity among the Seleucids, uh, I would push back on that notion. We see the same sort of fluctuations with the Romans, who putatively are the most capable guys doing this. Um, if you look at uh, Michael Dobson's book, The Army of the Roman Republic, he has a brief rundown of cavalry figures. Uh, I don't have it in front of me, but it is there. Um, and the Roman fluctuations, particularly the size of the um, cavalry of the Socii, vary substantially from one campaign to the next. So those sort of fluctuations are just the cost of doing business in warfare in the ancient world. I don't think they indicate something is wrong with the Seleucids. Um, my question is, is I, I wonder if this is a this is a great argument. I wonder if you feel like I could gain with a more comparative perspective looking across the Mediterranean, because of course we have five great powers, um, you know, uh, splashing around in this pond. They all have cavalry arms and um, I, I've done only a little bit of this myself. Uh, one of the things I found somewhat surprisingly is that when you dive into the figures, Roman cavalry deployments are not quite so unimpressive as you expect. They actually tend to look a lot more typical. Um, that the, Of the three Hellenistic powers, the Seleucids tend to have the largest cavalry detachments by some distance. And then the Carthaginian cavalry detachments are just bonkers huge. Um, and so um, in, in some ways, I think that that perhaps that angle would actually potentially strengthen your argument. It would put the Seleucids in a context where I mean, we expect them to have the strongest cavalry of the Hellenistic powers, but it puts them in a context that I think makes sense of them. And I wonder if that's a direction that you would consider taking this in if you think that would be useful. Yeah, so thank you for that. Um, well, it's funny that you actually mentioned that because the larger article that I'm working on is actually interested in that comparative approach. It's interested in taking it from the classical period, seeing what happens there, going through Alexander and then into the Hellenistic period to show that this fluctuation is common throughout all of those periods. And then I break down the Hellenistic period to look at, well, okay, what are the Diadochi doing? Because they're not technically, you know, they, you could argue they're slightly different from more settled empires. What are the Ptolemies doing? What are the Carthaginians doing? What are the Seleucids doing? obviously, and what are Greece and Macedon doing? Obviously for this paper, I could only focus on the Seleucids and otherwise we would have been here all day with lots of more numbers. So yeah, I definitely think that comparative approach helps that, and that's why I tried to include that graph at the end to show the fluctuations throughout the periods, that this is something that it isn't just a Seleucid thing, it's happening everywhere. And that's very interesting that you note that the Romans are doing similar things too, because I haven't had a chance to look at Rome as well yet. So thank you very much for that. Thank you very much. Um, 
anyone who wants to kick in right here with a Roman perspective, for example, before I bring up um, Alice's question. Um, I'm not seeing it. Oh yeah, here I have to scroll. Okay. Um, so Alice is asking, what do ratios mean? I thought about Napoleon's grand army in Russia, the largest European cavalry force ever assembled and a massive demonstration of political and military force with disastrous effects. And with clear tactical, strategic, economic considerations and differences to other campaigns. Yeah, so thank you for that. Obviously, I do not profess to know very much about the Napoleonic period. Um, I think these ratios, this is where I think it ties into the fact that when I say that these ratios can potentially tell us quite a lot about what is going on at the period, the time period as well, beyond just what numbers are at this battle, that it can give us some kind of insight into, um, like, what are the socio-political circumstances? Is there a reason why we can only bring so many? What are the, it would be perhaps interesting to see what are the after effects of that? Is it a case of we brought so many cavalry here or so many infantry here and we lose the battle and that is disastrous for us afterwards? Um, so, again, I think this is where we once again have to go through those individual circumstances. What is the context of it? Has that affected what proportions of infantry and cavalry we've got on the battlefield? What are the after effects of it? And <clears throat> yeah, definitely a comparative approach and comparing, well, what do other armies do? Do they do similar things and do they have the same kind of outcomes? Um, but yeah, I hope that answers the question. Well, I would like to follow up because um, without having thought of Napoleon, um, I uh, think um, the, the three adjectives, tactical, strategic, and economic, they are actually worthwhile uh, uh, dwelling on a little further. Uh, tactical, I think it, it's clear as how we um, in battle, whether they are only there to protect the flanks of infantry, so low numbers will do the typical Roman numbers, or wh whether they are supposed to do the main charge, any higher numbers and, and better trained ones. But the strategic, there are many strategic implications we have not yet made explicit today. And one very basic uh, thought is water supply. If we are um, on a campaign with a high number of horses, we need an awful amount of fresh water. And especially when um, the uh, well, when the campaign goes through desert or through other arid areas, even if it's overseas, um, well, shipping um, uh, cavalry overseas requires an awful lot of fresh water supply for the uh, horses. That is something that often ha well, always have to be kept in mind. How does this effect affect, uh, affect the whole campaign, and uh, also the cost? of the campaign. Um, another strategic factor, well, strategic, tactical, may be an expectation of how many horses the other side will field. That is a thought that I had when I was looking at your Raffia example and um, your Thermopylae example. Um, Raffia, the numbers were nearly even, although we think the Seleucids were able to field many more horses, they just did with fewer, possibly because they were expecting a lower number of the um, of the, the Ptolemies. And likewise with the Romans, I was quite struck. Um, 10,000 um, uh, infantry and 500 uh, cavalry, that is very close to the typical number of two Roman legions. Uh, so 5,000. Uh, um, infantry normally accompanied by one ala of 300 horse riders just to protect. So I was struck by these, uh, by the similarity. Um, and uh, well, we, we could dwell on um, economic implications. Um, the costs, well, deploying cavalry is just so much more expensive. And that is why I would be a little bit skeptical of Ben's previous thought that. Basically, 
whatever was recruited was much more random. What the king could get, he took with him. I think that this is more at the disastrous end or at the desperate end of things. Whereas uh, when a king was well established and things went pretty well, I think the choices he made were much more thoughtful. Also considering the high costs that um, any kind of military resources involve. So these three adjectives that, that Alice uh, threw in, um, I think they, they might help us and you structure your arguments um, a, a little bit more effectively uh, uh, when, when it comes to reflecting on the implications of these numbers. I'll take, can I just jump in? Um, sure. Quickly. Uh, um, it, yeah, and, and uh, you know, I think this speaks to what I was saying as well about, um, you know, the, the overall takeaway from all these numbers. I realize, uh, Sylvan, in what you were saying, that they can certainly be used to nuance our interpretations of individual battles and how important the Seleucids considered those battles. But the overall takeaway as to what the Seleucids are capable of at different times Perhaps they're capable of a lot. Perhaps later they're not capable uh, uh, so much. But how does this? How how do the conclusions you've reached really challenge our views about uh, uh, the Seleucids' ability to make war? In essence. Yeah. Sorry, I'm just writing that down. <laughs> <laughs> so unless you want to respond immediately, I'm um, also with a view to our time, I would um, then uh, call on uh, Nicholas. Yeah, that's fine. So um, I think I can offer you some extra information on provisioning and recruitment of troops, uh, because I'm mainly working on Babylonia at the moment, and there you have the astronomical diaries, and these are provide information on basically uh, celestial events, but also on prices in Babylonia itself. And these have been gathered and then uh, studied ex extensively by Reinhard Pirnkrieger in his uh, book, The Economy of Late Achaemenids and Seleucid Babylonia. And he also offers some notes on, I think, Antiochus III's Eastern campaign. And then there's another fragment, which is quite interesting about the first Syrian war, which uh, says that the satrap of Babylonia and Bactria gather troops and send them, as well as a lot of provisions, cattle, uh, even clothes and silver, to the king in Syria, um, which I think could be really interesting. They don't really give any numbers, but this may provide uh, another view. And uh, finally, there's an article of uh, from Engels from 2012-2013 in which he talks a bit about indigenous so, so, uh, soldiers. And he theorizes that Babylonians and Syrians were a part of the infantry, or at least the hoplite infantry, already from the beginning of the, the Seleucid kingdom, with Seleucus the first having to fight the Eastern satraps. So the series, is, of course, very uncertain, but I am personally quite fond of it. And I think this might also provide another view or another perspective on the Seleucid army, because in Babylonia itself, there were long-standing traditions of uh, Bitkati, like something like Klaus uh, land. And although these had developed quite a lot uh, since the Achaemenid periods, they were still more or less in function. So it would also be interesting to kind of study these. Yes, yeah, so thank you very much for that. I've looked a little bit into the Babylonian astronomical texts more when we're dealing with like the so-called elephant victory and like how many elephants does um Antiochus the first even have and like they record that they did send some elephants over and I think there's a reference in them to about 150 BC that says there's another battle where elephants are present so I've looked at them a little bit but yeah I need to look at them a bit more i think um so i will definitely look more into the book that you mentioned and engels's work as well i would definitely say yeah the babylonians are certainly a 
part of the Seleucid army. We do hear of that. And we know, as you said, you know, they're part of the Achaemenid army and they've got the particular lands that give troops. And I don't really see a reason why the Seleucids wouldn't have kept some of that system in place. So, yeah. There's a little bit of a problem with that land, of course, because a lot of it was bought by the temples themselves. So there is a question whether or not it still served as kind of the soldier's land. Um, unfortunately, there aren't a lot of Assyriologists working on that right now, or on the Seleucid period in, in general, but it's, yes. it's a lot of interesting source material. Yeah. But so, thank you. Uh, thank you also from my side, Nicholas. Uh, I have Pion Gruber for a long time on my reading list, uh, list. I have to get hold of a copy. Um, yet, uh, so uh, that was uh, useful uh, information also for things I'm doing. And the article of Engels you mentioned um, has been edited in uh, the, the Brussels volume, so Sell You Kids Study Day 5, 2019. Um, if uh, anyone is interested or needs it, it's easy to obtain um, a PDF from, from David or from myself. Um, and uh, well, just an, a, a general note, one of the, the intentions of this uh, digital lecture is, is to get us scholars and students in touch. Um, so it's easy for everyone participating to get in touch with us because our emails um, email, uh, um, addresses are on the website. Um, um, but uh, so if you have something Nick, uh, that you want to share, um, Please, it's up to you to to contact us. Just send us emails, um, and uh, we'll be happy to get back um, uh, to you. So um, it's easier than the other way around because we may not have your emails. Um, Hi. Yes. Yeah, it's just a remark. You know, thank you for your your presentation. Um, uh, one one of the uh, the limitations which we all suffer from. Is is the uh, is knowing what the terms of service, you know, what recruitment was uh, was uh, based on. Um, there was uh, no con yeah. no no real concept of citizenship, other than be the subject of the of the king, and. Uh, 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 there, there, there seems to be you know two groups of people. One who have uh, uh, well, um, we can call them Macedonians or or whatever loosely, yeah. And uh, and uh, uh, I perceive you know different terms of service for the recruitment of uh, of satellites uh, in the provinces, uh, you know subject peoples um but i think that there's a court the in the core of the kingdom there are there are well i i i, I discussed this at uh, the last conference uh, you know um macedonian ethnic status um, uh, people and we get the the salians who uh, a sort of a definable group and uh which have a different relation to the to the king, yeah. But I think that uh, all this is is based on um, on the conditions which they were settled under, yeah. Because the, the the basic core of the arm, army was uh, descended from uh, uh, Macedonian mainly settlers, but. With with maybe with a mixture of uh, all sorts of people we we don't know, but uh, the 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 Thessalians are particularly important because uh, you know they 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 have uh, they seem to be a, a community which is dumped there, um, settled in a in in a specific city Larissa, and uh, but. Uh, they retain their own uh, own systems of on onomastics, which is the same, and uh, they retain their cults, which is specifically the salian. And uh, you know, 
uh, it's, it would be difficult to argue that they're not to say you know dis descendants of a Thessalian community but what was you know what was the uh, what was the relationship of of this uh, to military service you know it, it's uh, it's um, um, a question which we don't have the answer to uh, at the moment and uh, uh, the um, and one of the factors is that we have no epigraphic documents to, to work on, which, uh, as you know, uh, Pierre Jehel, our mutual colleague, is, is, is working on the, uh, on the uh, mobilization decree of, uh, of uh, uh, the beginning, issued in the beginning of Philip V's reign, which contains uh, a very great amount of detail of uh, uh, what what the mobilization practices were in the Antigonid army in the in the Hellenistic period, and we we unfortunately have no simpler document to uh, to enable you know your work to uh, be more uh, more uh, your definite yeah. That's just a comment, but yeah, thank you for your presentation. Thank you. And yeah, the questions of recruitment are always complicated because we're working on very partial or confusing evidence a lot of the time. I'm always wary when we use the term Macedonians because I'm aware it becomes a sort of pseudo ethnic thing that means, oh, they fight like Macedonians. But yeah. I, I don't think that that, that but I think that that's exaggerated. Certainly, you can. Uh, uh, there, there are there are instances of uh, of um, uh, arguably uh, false false ethnics, but uh, the um, um, there are um, there's an interesting article by Daubner uh, about uh, uh, the Macedonians. Uh, which were which suddenly appear in the in in uh, 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 Atalid military colonies after after the Battle of Raffia, and uh, it might be no coincidence that uh, I think it's six thousand Halcaspides, you know, appear in the Daphne parade uh, immediately following the fall of the Macedonian kingdom. And uh, uh, well, I, I have argued that these uh, are an attempt to uh, to uh, you know, perpetuate the uh, the regiment of Alcaspides in Seleucid service. And so I, I think that the the argument for um, false ethnics is is very exaggerated. There's there's some there's some basis uh, there are some there are some basis is Bases for that argument, but uh, there are an overwhelming number of, uh, of uh, historical considerations that argue against. Yeah, and, but that's 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 an argument which which that's we're going into a well without a bottomless well of uh, argumentation. So uh, I don't want to. That it was just a comment, but but you know you were. Uh, uh, you know, thank you, thank you again for your presentation. But I thought the the point that uh, uh, I've forgotten what an, another correspondent said was uh, that uh, you know the Seleucid army would you would be ex expected to be more cavalry based than uh, than European uh, Hellenistic armies, and uh, I think this is uh, quite a valid point, but. Then the key is what are the terms of recruitment? Yeah, you know, you, you can have loads of Eastern horsemen, yeah, but you know, what? Why do they serve the king? Are they are they uh, forced to serve by some uh, some obligation for uh, a quid pro quo arrangement with the king with the ruler of the kingdom, or are they mercenaries? But you know, nobody serves without an obligation or pay. Yeah. 
Yeah, and that's when we start to move into that murky area of trying to understand. Yeah, mm, yeah. What people's status are and why they're there, and yeah, I try but, to, yeah. You know, the the, the I'm, I'm not the, the the it's it's a fundamental importance, and uh, and w if we if we don't if we don't understand that, but we don't understand it in the in the Seleucid, uh, in the case of the Seleucid monarchy, but you know all all. Uh, all further work is is uh, you know is a big is a big it lays a big question mark yeah yeah definitely. thank so you very much for your comments um, Christelle would like to um, intervene as well and uh, then I will also read Kishen's uh, question which is just arriving in my chat function um, Christelle please. Thank you. Thank you for this paper, and I'll be brief. And I feel uh, representing the Ptolemaic side, so I'll just jump on a few points that had been made, and um, first, and then I'll have a, a question. Uh, in terms of bibliography, there is a good article by Sandra Schöble, writer, on the Diadox um, and their cavalry. Uh, I can give you the reference by email after. Um, and then, uh, speaking of the heroic aspect of the cavalry king uh, in R Raffia for the Ptolemies, they really build on that. The Raffia decree represents in a kind of rupture with earlier uh, pharaonic representation, uh, um, Ptolemy the fourth on his horse. So, you know, we have the same thing there too. Um, it's an, another short comment about indeed heavy and light cavalry, we can know much more on the Ptolemaic side than you can, but uh, I was, you know, wondering if you, because you didn't really mention that yet, I mean, if you were able to extract a little bit more information, because as it was said, it's important in terms of costs. I mean, we know also, I mean, that the Ptolemies created, I mean, smaller uh, Cleroy for uh, light in cavalry, and over time, cavalrymen receive less and less land. So um, we see the problem of costs uh, on them very clearly, and I guess uh, you have to handle that too. And still with costs, that my questions about elephants, because uh, um, I guess that's too me uh, to go back to what uh, Altai was saying uh, in terms of supply, if you have in addition to take on for the elephants who are there, I mean, that should be part of your calculation when you think about how many, how many horses they can handle. And uh, for the Ptolemies, it seems, or I have argued that they stopped, uh, they have also the supply problems, obviously, that you don't have um, in the late second century. Also, Flavius Josephus mentioned Ptolemies VI, uh, dying so that just after where you stop in 145 because his horse was scared by one of his elephants but only Josephus says that so I don't know if you had some thought about elephants and um, you know if the Ptolemy what your thought about the Ptolemies I think they didn't have elephants and you know um, I was just curious about that if you had you know investigated other anesthetic armies and, uh, and the elephants so I so thank you and um, I did a little bit on Hellenistic war elephants before my PhD. So I did have a look at briefly what other places in the Hellenistic world are doing. When we talk about costs, elephants are definitely going to be up there because they just cost so much to have, they eat so much, they need so much water. They're definitely a major issue when we talk about logistics, more so than horses, even though you usually don't have as many elephants, except perhaps Ipsus, but Ipsus is We'll leave Ipsus to the side because that's another issue entirely. Um, with the Ptolemies, I don't know of as many instances where they used elephants. Raffia being obviously the major one. And I think they claim to have captured some Seleucid elephants when Ptolemy invades the Seleucid Empire a bit earlier. Um, they don't seem to be as keen, I think, on elephants as the Seleucids are. The Seleucids, I think, are the ones, other than the Carthaginians, who are using them the most consistently. But I think that's also because the Seleucids can get hold of them a bit easier, because um, they can go to India, and it's perhaps a little bit easier for them to get elephants, and elephants become a royal symbol for the Seleucids very quickly. So I think 
part of it is also this prestige as well as the fact of how we're going to use them in the army and i don't i i don't know i haven't actually looked in the tolls i don't think it's necessarily the case that that is symbolically important for the tolerance um i mean they're still important because elephants can embody kingship all those sort of ideas but i don't think it as is as important elsewhere than it is in the Seleucids. So I think it's definitely a Seleucid thing there. Um, as for the Cleroi, yeah, we it's kind of frustrating because we know so much about the Ptolemies and then we look at the Seleucids and we've got little bits that might suggest that there's something going on, but we really don't know. So yeah, it is actually frustrating when we look at the Seleucids that go, well, the Ptolemies are doing that. Are the, do we think the Seleucids are doing that or not? But yeah, that's something that I think is open to interpretation because the sources sometimes could go either way, depending on how you interpret them. Thank you. And thank you to, and good to hear that, you know, you, you would imagine the Ptolemy is not using elephants in second century and, and Flavius Joseph is just, you know, getting uh, impressed by elephants. And, and so thank you. Thank you. Uh, perhaps I, I may add, whilst we are speaking of elephants, uh, I see Nick's face. Uh, uh, Nick um, uh, contributed uh, an article to the Brussels um, conference and volume also on um, um, source references on elephants. And that reminds me of the important state in after thinking about rooting where come, where do elephants come from? Some may have come from India still, but the, the main recruitment source would still have been Apamea at least until the time of Antiochus V uh, uh, when uh, the Roman ambassador hamstrung the elephants there in 163-162. Um, and that, uh, well, mentioning Apamea, um, I think uh, we should also make it explicit that this was at the same time uh, meant to be the main a uh, horse breeding uh, space of the Seleucid kingdom. I don't know if we have more reliable uh, numbers for the time after Seleucid the first, but uh, there were meant to be 30,000 mares um, established by Seleucid the first, Seleucus the first. And I assume that we should expect at least a very high number well into the second century. Um, and to regard this as the main, not the only, but main recruitment source for horses and elephants. Um, so it would certainly be useful to um, look for uh, into sources around Apamea um, to get us an idea about recruitment practices and, and uh, capabilities. Um, I, I would now, uh, since we are, um, Running a little late, I would say the, the last question uh, will come from Kishen, and I read um, the relevant part of, uh, of, his, um, of his posting, which looks into the uh, um, and, and, and social um, background and conditions uh, of having um, a cavalry looking at the individual horse rider. So such a person would need to sustain um, his ability to serve as a cavalry uh, soldier. Um, and uh, so um, basically he's asking um, how were, were these people meant to generate the surplus to keep um, the war horse um, and cavalry? That the Seleucid kings cared to maintain the number of his cavalry forces economically? Well, that's not the suggestion, but a question. Uh, and then he's comparing this with the Ptolemaic evidence, the Fayum um, cavalry soldiers as landowners um, in the Fayum. And that's the surplus to maintain this. So I hope I was still clear enough, even though I was rambling a little bit, putting together the pieces. Yeah, so um, thank you very much for that question. Um, the topic of how you go about um, procuring your weapons or your horse for battle and who is actually paying for that is something that is very 
very debated, I think, in a lot of ancient armies. So um, that those economic questions, they build on what we've been discussing today, that is it the king that is going to pay for all of this, or are you expected as a cavalryman to secure all of that yourself and pay for that yourself? And I think I would possibly suggest that it depends very much on who you are in the Seleucid army. That if you are perhaps a member of the guard or the cataphracts, a very specific army, there's possibly some, or it's likely there's possibly some kind of state concern there. And as we mentioned, you know, there is the horse stud at Acamea. We also, Polybius tells us there's a royal horse stud in Media as well. So it may be you still have to pay it or it's coming out of your pay, um, but there's possibly some state concern. Once you get to the contingents that only show up for like a particular battle, they're just your allies, they're just the ordinary subjects. It might just be the fact that you own a horse is enough to make you eligible for the cavalry. You're expected to pay everything yourself and um, look after it yourself. Once we try to delve deeper into that and the other economic questions underlying that, it does get a lot more complicated because the sources are don't always give us the details that we would like there. Um, when we think about, say, land owning and things like that, this brings us back to, is there sort of a military settlement system for at least some of the army? And this is similar to what we hear in the Ptolemaic Empire, where we know there are cleroi for cavalrymen, and they're usually bigger than cleroi for infantry suggesting you know that you're expected to look after your horse on this land as well and also have room in a sometimes you know a higher status anyway so you get a little bit more land how far that translates into the seleucid kingdom is of course hard to tell because of the nature of the sources so it's more i think we can make guesses but we don't know anything um definite there's some debate as to whether a military settler would have someone working the land for him, particularly when he goes to war or whether he works it himself. I think that's, again, going to depend on the size of the land that you have. And again, that's something that's hard to tell from the sources that we have. Um, just looking at the question in the chat. Um, I hope I've answered the majority of it. But... Yeah, and well, otherwise, I am sure the discussion can go on via email or one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, discussions. We are approaching, well, the very end of our lecture and lecture series uh, today. And uh, with me thanking you, I would like to um, give the word to to, to Ben uh, to say a, a few final words. If you are up to it. I don't hear you, Ben. Not yet. Yeah, yeah, how about now? Yes. Okay. Yes, yeah. First of all, just to go back a couple of seconds, and then I'll, maybe I'll tie you can tell us about September and October if we have that confirmed. I don't know if we do. But, uh, but, but just, you know, the idea of this series was to be in touch with each other. Um, by the way, Nick, it's great to see you. You know, we're especially happy to see Nick. Um, but um, this this series this is now the fourth month. We hope to continue this, uh, you know, indefinitely into the fall and the spring. Um, and the idea of a work in progress, as we heard today, is especially refreshing, especially engaging, because we feel like we can all be involved in each other's papers, and this is what makes us colleagues. So I think that this is a very important exercise that we're doing, and maybe Altai can tell us what's happening next. Thank you very much, Ben. Uh, well, we um, we, con uh, we we will continue into the fall, and as next speakers, we have engaged Eva Anagnostou Laotides from Sydney, uh, who will speak on the Seleucid anchor, Stephen Harrison, who will speak uh, well, who is with us today, who will speak about uh, Achaemenid and Seleucid kingship models, and Kyle Erickson, uh, who is also with us today and uh, who is uh, has yet to decide uh, on the topic. 
Um, uh, we have not yet made final agreements on the dates, though we want to maintain the Seljukit Wednesday, third Wednesday of the month. So I hope I can soon update uh, the website and also send out another invitation through the Liverpool Classics list. Um, so expect something coming there very soon. And I can also uh, go one step further ahead. Eric Grun uh, and John Serrati, who is also with us today, have already agreed to contribute um, a talk in the winter term. So um, I am grateful to so well to all of you, to so many of you who actively participate and make this an event uh, where which is fun and which means learning and support it, learning from each other, supporting each other, and uh, it's a it's a wonderful thing to be part of this. So thank you very much um, for staying loyal with us for taking part um, and uh, and all of your feedback uh, will be welcome. If you want to present, there is still the opportunity to uh, accommodate uh, a paper of yours um, soonish, depending on your needs and your availability. Just get in touch with Ben or with me. I, I, I just wanna add that it's especially refreshing if we have people from other disciplines like you know, from like to today with the st statistics and things like that. So if you have colleagues who you think might be able to give us some insights from other disciplines, that's very welcome too. Absolutely, absolutely. So um, everyone, please do enjoy the last uh, weeks of the summer, and many of us uh, will soon find themselves back into um, the virtual classroom. Ideally, even in the physical classroom, I think that will be only very few of us. Um, uh, once uh, September comes, uh, I wish you strength and enthusiasm. So uh, when you will teach the next generation of students and never forget the Salu kids in your history lessons. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, everybody. Um, I will stay in the session for anyone who Chat and um bye.